Consitri was a quaint little farm town, everything neat and in its place, from the boxes of flowers outside of the windows of homes to the very people whom walked the streets to peer curiously at Bertha, sitting parked near the inn. The skeleton crew unpacked themselves from Bertha and sussed around the area, making sure there was nothing that could do some kind of harm to the fleshy inhabitants inside their carriages. Said fleshy inhabitants were quite tired of smelling like road, a smell of the wood stove, flesh only really bathed via bird bathing inside Bertha or in any creek they happened to come by, and just the dank of horses and leather. First, of course, was always in high spirits, as there was no brushes to attack her from behind and she had room to sprint away when someone pulled out a bar of soap. <laughs> Fuck's sake, dirty wee bitch. What is it with dogs not wanting bath, but they love water? Yeah. Like, they love swimming, but yeah. they hate getting bathed. Like, bathed. I it's don't really, know. It's so unusual. Concetra villagers were taken aback slightly at the elite bodyguard that seemed to appear around Bertha. Two men in suits of heavy armour, one adorned with many lamellar plates from shin to head, another in full plate with horns on his helmet, and the inscription of a minotaur woman on his chest piece as well as a curious doggy door, (laughs) where two yellow glints could be seen within. That's quite nice. It's got like a wee flap almost. Flap for him, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. A lot of thoughts. Been put under the armour angle. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Three more dismounted from the top hatch, all in various forms of leather armour, and two of which hefted rifles and pistols, and another with glinting steel plates on his gloved knuckles. Most curious of this guard was that their faces were all hidden under their helmets and face masks, and the sun shone on nothing but dark pits where their eyes should be. Villagers watched and waited as the bodyguards stalked around and checked every corner and nook they could find, before one waved at one with a long rifle on top of Bertha, and the guard knocked on the roof with a thunk thunk. If the guard... (laughs) If the guard was bizarre... What came out of the giant carriage caught everyone off their own guard? Two Belimian women, adorned in their cultural tattoos, stepped down from the door and stood on the gravelled parkway, stretching and cooing at the large inn before them. One even had what looked like a metal leg, which whirled and clicked as she walked, while the other looked like someone who robbed battle sites from the amount of random gear and belts adorned her, as well as the giant battle axe that bobbled on her back and the many knives that ringed her belts. After them, a large Oni woman stepped out wearing a lighter outfit, travelling outfit, and a cloak, with the smaller Oni walking down behind her. The smaller one looked like a bookworm, or a mage, as she seemed to lack any real combat gear besides a giant book that was in a satchel on her side. They seemed equally eager to get inside, and called inside for someone named Omen. Omen stepped into the morning light, and seemed the most normal out of this group except for some small scars that adorned her arms. One on her cheek which seemed fresh, and wore nothing but a normal steel breastplate, a single sentry pauldron, and a short sword that hung at her hip. After Omen came a knoll, eagerly wagging her tail and snuffling the air as she hefted a rifle off her own. Well, you just know they're up to no good, Samantha Aldrin, one of the villagers, said to her friend Yaris, and Yaris agreed with a chuckle. What on earth are they putting in that stable? It looks like a giant rooster. I want a bath, Millie groans, leaning against Chiron as Kyla and Harla get the room situation handled. They have been on the road for days now and while Bertha provides many comforts, bathing was definitely not one of them and they had not been able to properly bath in hot water since they left Taliab. First no want bath, first just want fresh meat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> First look towards the dining area, still awash in the smells of breakfast, and the aroma chased away the memories of the road provisions they had been eating since leaving the big city. Omen agreed with Millie. After spending so much time in that city, I'd forgotten what it felt like to be actually dirty again. I'm afraid it spoilt me. After rooms were bought, everyone more or less split up in the town, with almost all of the female members of the group heading to wash away the road. The inn was exceptionally large and featured a full bathhouse portion, fitted with instant hot water via boilers and types of tubs depending on what money is spent, wood, iron, etc. 
I don't trust Garber with bathhouses. I don't trust him. Either. I don't trust I, him. I don't like where this. I don't like going. where this is going I, either. I think we're gonna have some like nasty surprises. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. It's up to you. What you if what, if you call them nasty surprises <laughs> or not? A little more money is spent, and first is lured into a bathing room. Lured? How <laughs> the fuck do you lure her into the bath? <laughs> Grab her by her collar and drag her. <laughs> Throw feet balls in the bath. <laughs> Where deft maiden and male hands quickly yonk her inside and disarm her before a fight can start, and so she can be bathed. Apparently a member of the party was not fond of the wild dog smell inside of Bertha. The skeletons, however, have gone their own way in the little town and are exploring, either bothering the locals on information about alchemists, prowling around the houses because they believe the town is too nice, and searching for some sort of deviancy. Or just loitering around the living members and providing area security. Auspicious visits the local general store and buys a load of brushes for his small fleet of horses and horse treats. With the threat of giggling children constantly whirling around his leg as he tries to shop. He overpays by a large margin and waves away their offering for change. The innkeeper of this place and also the bartender is a huge fellow whose hands look like they have seen some action and has a large brown beard and is bald from the eyebrows and beyond. A little bit of prying and questions are asked from the skeletons about the town, and the bartender tells them that they are a special town with a very unique kind of people. But not to worry, because all of them are just farmers now. Nay. Nay. That's a very... Uh, Nay. Nay. That's a very unusual way of putting it. As their eye sockets roved around, they agreed that all of the village folk were rather fit if not downright pinnacles of health at their age. Above that, they were downright friendly, their kids healthy and happy, and the town really was quite perfect in all senses. The skeletons even find a shrine to the many gods known throughout the world, just outside of the inn and tucked back in a manicured little wood area, a limestone walking path leading them to it. Rowdy sees a statue that looks like Luigi? <laughs> Luigi? <laughs> Luigi. Right. Tell me that's not Luigi. Alright, Garbo, is that Luigi? Or are you going to have to spell it out for us next time? Louis? 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 Is it Louis? Look, we'll call him Luigi, it'll be more fun. Yeah, I'm going to keep calling him Luigi. <laughs> Rowdy sees a statue that looks like Luigi, the mask god of whom he patrons, and he makes a few attempts to try and communicate. Perhaps after stabbing an innocent boy and killing an older woman, Luigi is giving Rowdy the cold shoulder, or is just playing around with the poor skeleton. As the statue, when Rowdy looks away, changes poses and faces as if it's contemplating the skeleton, or reacting to his thoughts that he sends heavenward. Furious trying to figure out just who he prayed to in his past life, lays amongst the statues, then screams towards the heavens mentally. (laughs) Judging by the statue of Luigi, now wincing and covering the sides of his mask with his hands, he's being heard in some form of another, but no one answers him. Agile communes with Finitri easily when he finds her statue, and the two talk about a few small things such as Millie and the fall, before Agile pulls out a brush and begins dusting off her statue, doing a little area beautification before setting off to hang out with Millie. Auspicious shows up, and after a bit of going in circles looking at the statues, cannot find one of Orler. The little flame inside of his chest lantern isn't surprised, but is taken aback as Auspicious begins to find wood and lumber, rocks and stone, and spends a couple of hours building a little shrine to Orler, beside the statue of Melanie, the goddess of love. When the little roof goes up, the flame is bouncing around in the lantern excitedly, watching Auspicious work with much glee, chittering about how he used to have all kinds of things like this back in the good old days when I used to get a good amount of offerings. The rest of the skeletons are hanging out with the living crew, as Auspicious whittles a little wooden flame puff to put inside the shrine, being the only one outside as the sun falls away into the inky black of night. The party has gone to bed, Furious remaining downstairs, and the rest of them parked about the inn to watch for travel. 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 Watch for travel. (laughs) Stack them up, (laughs) Furious is fuming. As the rest of the skeletons have patron gods they can communicate with, as he remains lost as who he is, and where he is going along with all of this. Lost your way, have you? A voice rumbles out of the darkness of the inn dining room, as this kitchen has shut down and only the night porter is awake, around the corner and out of sight. 
Furious lifts his mask skull up to see a man sitting in one of the chairs a few feet away from him and a large rucksack on the floor beside him. The figure looks road-worn, his leather boots ruddy and caked with dirt, his travelling cloak almost threadbare and colour in certain places washed away by the sun. He's smoking a pipe, rough and rustic in its construction, but the embers burn bright and cast a myriad of shadows over its form. The figure inhales long and slow, and Furious can see the rough face underneath that is adorned with kind, knowing eyes. Who are you? Do you know me? Furious asks softly, leaning forward and placing his iron-knuckled hands on the oak table. The figure just chuckles. I know all who wander the roads of life and have lost their way. Is this Gandalf? Yeah, it fucking sounds like Gandalf. Honestly, I wanted Furious to have like the god of fucking curb stomping or some is shit. It, is it Gandalf who says that? All, all those who wander. Mm. No, yeah, it not is, all those yeah. who wander are lost. lost yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that is actually. Yeah. I know all who wander the roads of life and have lost their way. You could say that. I am the way. Is that like a fucking shitty tape? Do you know the way? <laughs> yes. Oh my god, not that fucking thing. Stop it. I was thinking, like, is that actually? Do you know the way you mean? Please Look, tell me it isn't. We all know Garbo's a bummer at this stage, isn't it? Get with the kids. <laughs> the kids go with them. You gander knuckles memes, don't they? <laughs> don't you worry, your little bony head, my friend. You were lost, but now you're found. And I will help you find a way. (laughs) 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 The way stands, shoulders his rucksack and tips his hat to Furious. Oh God, he's a neck beard as well. Oh my God. What was the noise that they made that um, fucking cocking noise? Oh yeah. Yeah, fuck no, I don't mind me, that meme is horrible. Get it out, we're not saying, speaking of that meme ever again. Okay, the way stands, shoulders his rucksack and tips his head to Furious, before walking away and disappearing into the dark shadows of the room, the thuds of his boots seeming to echo hauntingly on the last step. Uh, alright, see you later, okay? Furious says nervously rattling his fingertips on the table as the situation was rather awkward for him. Outside, Auspicious has been walking around while whittling, checking up on his many horses and chicken. He is quite unhappy to be in the stinky stables than his lovely nest inside the original stolen carriage. Auspicious just shakes his head as Orler is still telling him about the golden days and finally finishes up his whittling of his flame god's token setting it inside the handmade shrine he completed earlier in the night and places a little candle inside of it, lighting it up. Pleased with his work, he leans back, his shiny metal horns glowing in the moonlight and sets down to watch the little flame dance in the light when the trickles by. To those who may wander past, and some figures do, they see a great metal warrior sitting down and back on his hands, watching the little shrine flame dance as his own helmet and breastplate shine brightly against the lantern light that mounted on his chest. Rowdy has been out and about in the woods and skulking around the house getting bored guarding, naturally, and sees movement in the woods. Rowdy is able to slip into the woods and line up right behind the figures, matching step with the man in front of him so they won't even hear his footsteps. The skeleton doesn't even have to breathe and his armour is well oiled. Rowdy sees that these people are clearly villagers, but in between them are goblins and hobgoblins, tied via rope cuffs to each other, being led by spear points through the woods in what looks like a well-worn game path. Rowdy alerts the other skeletons, who pour away from what they are doing and begin to move towards Rowdy. Except Auspicious, he's just chilling. Rowdy follows them all the way to where he sees a torchlight and tucks away into the woods again into the shadows, and skirts around to where he can stay hidden and watch. Inside the little clearing is a giant pit, or what looks like a fighting pit, with rows of pointed spears dug into the earth and pointing in towards the pit, so no creature can get out without first having to tangle with the sharp spikes. There are a lot of villagers here, all holding various forms of weaponry, and those weapons looking well maintained, if not old and well used. Adjacent to the pit is a cage, which has more goblins and hobgoblins inside of it, and a rack of swords stand arrayed outside of the cage and near the entrance of the pit. Rowdy is what the fucking hard as the other skeletons, minus Auspicious, 
arrive and are now also taking in the sight before them with mixed reactions. They watch as a woman welding a pole axe hops down into the pit and she's pretty much all ready to go for whatever happens next. A hob, I want me a hob. No cheating me this time either. Alexander, you give me a lame one last time and it about lasted as long as my husband does in bed. Oi, is heard from the crowd and a chorus of laughter echoes against the trees in the night sky. Alexander is also laughing and pulls out a hob who he unties when down in the pit. The hobgoblin is confused and backs away from the woman when something thumps down beside him. A short sword is laying there in the dirt. The woman with the pole axe is grinning wildly and she begins to step towards the hob, her feet measured and her shoulders rolling like a predator. The hob reaches down and picks up the sword, holding it shakily as he sees that this is going to be a bit of a messy situation he found himself in. Furious ain't gonna stand for this shit and bursts out of the tree and jumps down into the pit, landing with the ripple of dust. The torchlight traces along the sexy and lewd forms that adorn his (laughs) armour. As well as the odd goose as Furious stands tall and defiant. Why don't you pick a fight with someone more your level? He growls and begins to move towards the woman. The other skeletons rattle out from the wood line, panicked and furious as charge, as they send an SOS back to Auspicious. Back at the shrine, Auspicious has been placing little offerings in the shrine to try and encourage perhaps some patronage in the future to his endeavours, but perks his head up. Auspicious gets the message and sighs, standing up with a groan and shaking loose his cobwebs. At the time, an untied boot kicks open the side door of the inn, and Kyla is standing there in a cloak and her sleeping clothes, looking red-eyed and angry as a lot of the chatter has flowed over into her as well in their panic to try and reach Auspicious. What the fuck is going on? Back at the pit, the woman is yelling at Furious. Aye, this hob is mine. Why don't you wait your own turn? She bellows while parrying the hob easily and catching it in the gut with the end of her poleaxe. Furious is being yelled at from the edge of the ring by the other skeletons, and it's made him pause as he stops to yell back about how all of this is bullshit. All the other villagers are quiet, watching the fighting down in the pit. Agile moves over to Alexander and begins to pester him about what's going on, as down in the pit there is a meaty smack and the scream of a hob. We have to keep our skills up. No real forts or anything nearby that can help us in time if we need it. And besides, these hobgobs are constantly raiding towns and smaller villages all over the place. They won't be missed. This is more like a creative way of doing pest control. Agile isn't too sure about that answer. As down in the pit, the woman challenges Furious. Furious, eager for the fight, smashes his iron knuckles together with a shriek of sparks and the two immediately get into it. Furious has to duck and dodge her blows as best as he can, but even then keeps catching the backhand attack from her after he dodges, and she's plinking away at his HP. At the same time, she's wearing no armour, so every punch and flying knee is winding her, and blood can be seen on the side of her mouth. The villagers all watch silently as they fight, none of them moving, as the skeletons all kind of grip up to watch as well. Furious Skeleton is fighting for his morals at this point and what he believes. As to him, this is nothing more than a slaughter and a provision of training, as they take other humanoids and chuck them into the ring just to die over time to fighters way over their skill level. Furious punches the woman right in the breast and she roars, staggering backwards and clutching at her chest. (laughs) Teddy shot, yeah. This is the one time the crowd around them reacts. Some chuckling and others sucking in air through their teeth. You fucking prick! The woman bellows and bull rushes furious, whipping the head of her poleaxe like a battering ram and smashing it against his shoulders, near the neck, as he fails to move out of her strike range quick enough. However, there is an oddity, as a small honk is heard from somewhere about furious. What? And now, somehow, furious is holding her poleaxe. Is the gimp circumcit magical? I'm going to come. Oh God. What? All the skeletons say aloud at the same time. And even the villagers seem surprised that the skeleton was able to pry the weapon from her without even reaching for it. Furious stands there shocked, holding her pole axe in his hand while the woman is looking down at her empty hands with mixed facial emotions of disbelief and frustration. 
furious skeleton tosses the poleaxe over his shoulder and out of the pit. And some of the villagers just casually lean out of the way to avoid getting bunked by it. Real pit fighting ours now, <laughs> Furious says with a laugh, and begins to beat down in earnest, while suffering a few savage blows as well as she begins to rage and throw her weight into wild punches. Furious comes to a halt, a wild punch bouncing off his helmet head as he hears a voice from behind and above him. That is enough! Kyla is standing there, hot-tempered, red-eyed, her boots unlaced, and her sleeping clothes covered in leaves and sticks. Behind her is Auspicious, holding up Orler in his lantern to cast light upon her so she can see through the woods. An impressive sight, despite the lack of battleware from the necromancer. Furious tells her what's going on, and she answers him back in kind that, Is it really worth all this trouble over some damn goblins and hobgoblins? What happens if you kill that woman? Look at the odds. Furious looks around. And indeed, they are surrounded by retired adventurers, but all of them deadly and very clearly well-trained. They barely made it out alive from the two elite combatants at the siege. What would it be here when it's 5 versus 30, 40? Furious goes to exit, but when he tries to leave, the woman goes to attack him from behind. Dirty bitch. Dirty bitch. He is able to smoothly duck the rear attack and heft the woman above him her battle roars echoing into the sky before the body slams into the dirt. A few bones are heard to break, but Furious just brushes the dirt off from his armour and steps out of the ring. The skeletons were thoroughly admonished all the way back to the inn, and as soon as they left, they dragged the woman out of the pit. Clerics healed her up, and they simply continued to train in the pit. The skeletons sat close guard outside the party's room to make sure no retribution attacks came, but none did through the night and into the morning. As the living members work and broke the fast of the night with the other villagers who came to eat with their families before going out and doing their works, a lot of the villagers who were on that night's training rotation were there and quickly the tale of Furious has spread. Despite his curious armour, villagers tall and small were giving him approving nods or patting him on the shoulder as they passed. It seems his actions were respected or at least his convictions. Kyla was still on their asses though, about putting their noses where they weren't welcomed, and was harrying them mentally and heatedly all throughout the morning while they racked up and set off down the road. The little town of Cancitra fell behind as they clopped away, both carriages making their way back down the road towards their destination of Lisa. The living members of the party were not all that excited to be back in the road for the next couple of days, but they had bought some things that morning to make Bertha a bit more livable such as curtains, cushions, better blankets and more luxurious foodstuffs to help take away the edge. First was still fuming at the other members of the party, sitting next to drunk on the rear carriage, her rifle laid across her lap. Then they take first paws and scrub them. Look! Paws all clean, no dirt! <laughs> first would die of shame if first could. She's fumed showing both of her quite clean hands to drunk, who snorted as he held the reins of the horse, but gave her some milk taffy to keep her mouth busy. <laughs> the days passed without much report, carriages, wagons, walkers, hikers and horsemen passing by Bertha with regular appearances. Those up in the top lookout slot would wave, strangers would wave back, and the skeletons fell into a lull of complacency as there was little action to really look forward to. Most doing their duties as sentries, cleaning armour, weapons, or diddling dicks on everything they saw fit. <laughs> By the third day, the rear lookout roost and the top lookout slot looked like walls of marine portage on. <laughs> dicks everywhere. Yeah. Just everywhere. But then, one morning, the clouds darkened and down came the rain. The rain pelted down from the heavens in sheets, a dull roar that filled the sound of everything. While those inside Bertha and driving Bertha had ample cover, first and drunk had only their cloaks and rain slicks to help them. This bullshit, this bullshit, <laughs> growled first, holding her rifle close to her chest as she sat snuggled up to drunk to try and keep more rain from hitting her slick. Aye, my little furry lass, this is indeed bullshit, drunk grumbled. Chicken was inside the carriage and wasn't sure what the fuss was about. 
The rain continued down for the whole day and even into the night as they brought their little convoy to a halt about 500 yards from the tree line the road ran through, letting the horse rest and eat the sodden grass around them, staked out in pickets. Near them a couple and their kids came to a halt as well, pulling out a wagon tent to lean and quickly ducking underneath it for some cover. They were a modest family, man, woman, daughter and son, and were road-worn and quite wet at this point. Thunder rumbled in the sky above and lightning lit up the dark clouds and flashing cascades of light for mere seconds before submitting the world back into a wet darkness of storm. The skeletons were posted up around Bertha, as Chicken could handle himself, and first had ducked into Bertha to get warm, and the bony boys took an interest in the family. Hello there, said Aspicious cheerfully, who stood in front of the opening of their little tent they had running off their wagon. He said this just as the lightning punctured the sky and the flashes of light lit him up to the point he looked like a monster peeking under the tent <laughs> flap. <laughs> the kids screamed, but the parents just laughed as they had saw him earlier getting the horse undone and setting their pickets for Bertha's drafts. Auspicious helped them light their fire and chatted with them as drunk gave the kids candy. Oh, don't take candy from drunk. I wouldn't be taking no candy, candy from, from drunk. drunk. And the family filled them in on news around where they were coming from and where they were going. The family were on their way to Talaib after selling their farm, in which Rowdy asked the farmer what he did for a living. There was an awkward pause before the farmer told him, again, very slowly, that he was a farmer. (laughs) Yeah, but what type of farmer though? That's a valid question. Yeah. There's tons of different types of farmers, you know? Near Lisa. As things weren't getting too weird and too hot there, as elves were up running around again and trying to purge lesser races from their lands, harassing Lisa for harbouring fugitives and flushing up all a manner of magic things up into the land surrounding theirs. That, and with Ardermans also heating up, they wanted to be somewhere safe. And if news is correct, Talia broke the backs of a siege not too long ago and the area is pretty safe for the time being, so they were heading there to buy a farm. The skeletons tell them it's true, spin them a few good tales, then ask them about the forest and way ahead to Lisa. Oh, all kinds of strange things have been happening in that forest, the man says as rain patters down in the tent cloth and the small fire pops and clicks. Some women claim they came out of the forest with an extra baby, children's hair changing colours, some people going missing, shapes and things moving among the shadows in the trees. Standard stuff, really, this day and age around Lisa. The skeletons hmm and feed the information back to the lookouts, who are already on vigilance as the entire vibe is pretty spooky, even for the spookers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has the old skeleton party got a name yet? Skelly Boys? Yeah, the Skelly... Oh, yeah, okay. Skelly Boys so, does Skelly work. Boys, yeah. yeah. I like the idea. Like, I like the spookers. Bone Zone Brothers? The Bone Zone Brothers? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go with Bone Zone Brothers, yeah. Through the night, the skeletons do keep seeing shadows moving in the woods, and the lightning is casting some even more strange and bone-rattling shapes in the trees. The skeletons bid the family good night and go back to their duties around Bertha. Rowdy borrows Agile's rifle after going inside Bertha, since Agile is napping down below for whatever reason, and pops up into the top lookout, peering through the scope as he trails it through the woods. Furious is making his rounds in the rain, his boots splashing on the wet grass loudly, when he sees something odd happening over by the wagon of the family. The fire of theirs has gone down to coals, so not much light is left, but he can see movement from the other side of the tent and wagon, but he can't make out what it is. You better come up with your hands raised or I'ma fuck you up! (laughs) He, He roars in challenge and is stomping towards the tent. However, the head of the wife pops up, and she asks if something is the matter. He can pick up on the sounds of wet footsteps for a few split seconds heading towards the woods, but the rain is still very heavy and masks a lot of the sounds. Rowdy then sees something and squints into the glass. It's brief in the lightning light, but he spies a long pointed ear. Skeletal klaxons blaring, people screaming, sirens screeching. Alert is raised among all the skeletons, even Agile jerking up with a snort as the other skeletons barrel out of Bertha to usher the other family towards the carriage. Chicken isn't excited about all this and screeches an insult before being tossed out of the carriage and the family stuffed into it for safety. Chicken thinks this is all bullshit as he and Aspicious sit guard under the wagon cover, 
Furious guards the family, and the rest of the skeletons are socked to the forest as they wait for an attack. But none come. All the way into the morning, with the rising of the sun, it gives some light into the dairy scene. It's still raining heavily as the family wakes, says their thanks, and the skeletons help them get their wagon together and send them on their way before getting their own carriages back up and running. Agile notices the wife of the family looking back at them, smiling and giving them a wink. The fuck? He murmurs, but takes no real note of it. <laughs> the carriages lurch back into motion and make their way into the forest of Hanos Way. Due to the spooky nature of the forest, first is now on top of the carriage that Drunk is driving and all viewing ports are filled with skeletons. Auspicious has his little fox familiar peeping out of his breastplate as an extra set of eyes as well. And the rain is not as bad within the forest, but the light is as dim as could be. Auspicious lights his carriage lantern, as does Drunk. Rowdy, sitting tail gunner, can barely make out Drunk in his driver's seat through the gloom despite being only 10 to 15 yards away. It being that dark and that rainy despite being the middle of the afternoon, the shadows are seen dancing in the trees again and the skeletons are already readying their weapons. There's an ambush, they can smell it. Crows are calling from the trees, as some crows don't caw at all and watch the carriages. Drunk's free hand is resting on his axe, and Auspicious has his warhammer within easy hand's reach. The living party members are well aware of what's happening, and they too are more or less waiting for the attack, Millie constantly sheathing and unsheathing her boot knife. Drunk hears a splash to his right after about another hour and leans over, picking up his axe as he does. He hears panting, and it's first, running up into the carriage and sitting beside him on the seat. She's quite muddy, but it seems as if she fell off the carriage rooftop somehow. Are you okay, lass? Oh yeah, I'm fine. I got knocked off by Big Brunch. <laughs> For sake, first. first says happily, squeezing the water out of her cloak and shaking the mud from her hands. Indeed. Drunk says, and looks over to where he knows Rowdy is, sockets wide. Since when did first speak so well? Drunk sends a necroscope to Rowdy, who jerks up and leans out of the rear window of the tail position, squinting as best he can through the rain and dark. He can see a couple of blobs that look like Drunk and first, but not much else. I, uh, first, where's your rifle? Drunk says slowly, trying to maintain his cool. Ah, yes, I think I dropped it when I fell, and I didn't want to be left behind. It's okay. I can just buy a new one along the way. Mm, something's weird here. <laughs> this is Drunk stares at her. They've been going barely walking speed due to the mud. She could have grabbed the rifle and jogged to catch up quite easily. Ah, that solves it. First seems quite pleased at his response and begins to hum, looking forward into the forest. Drunk is rattled. <laughs> and is telling everyone so. Rowdy pulls out his pistol and fires a shot. It was aimed low and right, splashing into the mud and throwing the dark muck all over the carriage wheels of Drunk's charge. Why are they shooting? Screamed first, who clutches Drunk's arm as she shrinks away from the splash. Who shoot? First heard gunshots. First and Drunk look up to see first, staring down at them with their rifle. First is looking at first, who is looking at first and blanches, knowing her cover is blown. Um, did first miss something? Whispers the first looking down with a rifle, and drunk can hear the small clicks as she tacks the hammer back to half cock. The other first grips drunk's breastplate and pulls him towards her. She hisses, this will all go easier if you don't fight. Ah, shite. Drunk gasps, as suddenly dozens of figures lurch out of the woodline and begin jumping and clambering onto Bertha. 